everyone uh, to uh, today's uh, session and book launch. It's a great pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, my name is uh, Adam Hania. I'm a, a, a reader in development studies here at SOAS, uh, the University of London. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to be the host and uh, moderator of this book launch. Uh, we're lucky to hear today from Kritika Varogur, who is launching her very new book, launched I think in April 2020, uh, entitled The Call, Inside the, Globi, the Global Saudi Religious uh, Project. It's published Columbia Global Reports. Um, Krithika is an award-winning journalist. Uh, she's covered Indonesia for The Guardian and has reported widely from Southeast and South Asia uh, for publications including The Atlantic, The New York Review of Books, Financial Times, uh, The New York Times. Uh, she uh, corresponds regularly for outlets like NPR and the BBC, Democracy Now! and she's been supported uh, her work by uh, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and the International Women's Media Foundation, among many other institutions and, and trusts. Uh, uh, Kritika is uh, well known to us here at SOAS because uh, we were very lucky to have her uh, as a Fulbright Scholar uh, where she completed her master's uh, degree here uh, last year. She's currently based in New York um, under lockdown as many of us are at the moment. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be hosting the event and, and to be hearing from, uh, from Kritika uh, today. So just to explain a little bit how the format of the session will be, in a, se in a second I'm going to hand uh, over to Kritika, who will speak uh, uh, on her book and some of the major themes uh, and impetus for writing it. Um, then I'm going to engage with her uh, for a little bit around uh, some questions that I have uh, over her work and her research and her writing for about 10 minutes or so. Then we'll open up for questions uh, from the audience. We have a, a great uh, attendance today, I think just uh, just shy of 80 at the moment. Uh, so what we will do uh, is ask people to uh, type in questions uh, through the chat function that you can see on the right hand uh, side of the screen. I will collect um, those questions and feed them through to Kritika uh, so we can uh, we can keep things um, uh, orderly and and uh, uh, make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask what they what they like. So uh, if that sounds okay to everyone, uh, I'm very happy to pass over now to Kritika and ask her to say uh, some introductory remarks on on her book. Thank you. Um. Thank you so much, Adam. Can everyone hear me? Just want to make sure my video and audio are working well. Um, great. So uh, my name is Kritika, and I'm really happy to be here with Adam, who was my dissertation advisor at SOAS. Um, so my book, The Call, is about Saudi money. It's about what Saudi money really did in the Muslim world which is something we've heard a lot about in vague terms, I think, in many of the countries, certainly the one I grew up in, uh, which is the United States. Um, there, I was seven years old when 9-11 happened, and I spent most of my young and adult life in, under the so-called war on terror. Um, one of the kind of canards of th this era that who we all live in is that Saudi, is this idea of Saudi terror finance, the idea that Saudi Arabia has somehow finance or created all manner of terrorists, extremists, jihadists, and so on. And famously, of course, 15 of the 19 9-11 hijackers were Saudi nationals. Um, so we kind of grew up with this idea. And then when I was 22 and after I graduated from college, I moved to Indonesia, which is the world's largest Muslim majority country to work as a journalist. And something crazy that happened once I was there and I was reporting on religion and politics is that I heard this concept of Arabisasi yet again. And Arabisasi, which is Indonesianized word for Arabization, was the same idea that Saudi influence or Saudi finance or proselytization had somehow fundamentally changed the religious landscape of their country. So this was really interesting to me that I had gone literally halfway across the world and, and was hearing the same concept, again, in somewhat big terms. So I started reporting on what Saudi money really did in the world's largest Muslim majority country. And what I found was super interesting. It wasn't that they had, you know, financed terrorists directly, or that wasn't the whole story anyway. There are a very small number of 
jihadists or terrorists in Indonesia, all things considered. But I did find that there was this six decade long campaign um, by the Saudi kingdom from the royal family, from the king downward, to propagate their conservative brand of Wahhabi Islam um, since the 1960s in Indonesia. And this took a, a lot of different forms from scholarships to close personal relationships with key Islamic leaders, to um, a Saudi religious attache who was attached to the embassy, to, um, to supporting preachers and mosques directly, to supporting Qurans and translated books and so on. So there were a lot of different vectors of influence and I reported on what some of these meant, including um, a, a Saudi university in Jakarta, which was the subject of my dissertation at SOAS um, and, and which features in my book as well. And as I reported on it, I realized there was a great hunger to learn more about what Saudi many meant to a lot of readers around the world. So I um, branched out my inquiry and realized that because this Saudi campaign to spread Wahhabism was truly global in nature, uh, a book about the subject would ideally also be global in scope. So that's why I branched out to two other continents beyond Asia. Um, and my book also looks at Saudi influence in Nigeria which is the most populous country in Africa, and at Kosovo, which is a very small um, Balkan nation in Europe, which is about 98% Muslim and has had a very interesting kind of Saudi influence after the fall of the former Yugoslavia. Um, so I took these three case studies, which are all majority Muslim countries. I mean, we're pretty sure in the case of Nigeria, they don't really take the census in that way anymore because it's very contentious. But three very large, um, Muslim majority democracies, um, which are outside of what we tend to think of as the Muslim world, at least in our popular imagination. But to me, this was really important to decenter um, the project. And I found a lot of interesting patterns and connections. Um, at every country that I looked at, there were close personal contacts between the kingdom and these countries and people in these countries that helped see the relationship. So it wasn't like they were throwing money at these countries or, um, I don't know, some kind of nefarious plot. It was it was a, it was really a soft power project through and through, which I thought found super interesting and wouldn't have necessarily known un, until I went to report it. Um, so I'm going to tell you just a tiny bit about, you know, based on my research, what the shape of this campaign is. And I hope that you will read the book for a more detailed picture. So basically, Wahhabism is the state religion of Saudi Arabia. It was founded in the late 18th century by a desert preacher named Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who uh, looked around him and thought that Muslims had lost their way. Uh, he saw deviance everywhere. He thought a lot of things that people were doing from uh, venerating saints, to praying at tombs, to all kinds of folk practices, had deviated from Tawheed, which is the pure monotheism that he felt was at the heart of Islam. And in pursuit of his goal to return people to the right path, as he saw it, he advocated violence and he had this kind of marauding band, and it was very contentious right from the start. Um, so he was eventually ejected from his home region and sought um, sought to establish a new base in uh, with near near Riyadh, basically, the modern day capital of Saudi Arabia. So he made a pact with the House of Saud and um, pledged religi religious legitimacy for the Saudi royal family's um, designs on the Arabian Peninsula in exchange for their protection of him and, and their uptake of his interpretation of Islam as their state religion. So this pact between the Wahhabi clerics and the Saudi royal family is in place up until today. That being said, the country that we now call Saudi Arabia was only only came together in 1932. It's a very young country. It's not even a century old. Um, and oil was found there in 1938. So a lot of the things that we think are just fundamentally Saudi, like oil money and, and being a theocracy, they're all rather new 20th century inventions. Um, and even within the Muslim world, even though Saudi Arabia is, of course, the birthplace of Islam, uh, which is the religion of 1.8 billion Muslims, and counting today, um, it didn't really seek to assert itself on a world stage until the 1960s. It was King Faisal, the monarch who came to the throne in 1965, who really tried to pioneer this kind of foreign policy based 
on Al Tadamun al Islami or Islamic solidarity. And he was the one who entered this post colonial world where all these new countries were being invented almost out of scratch in Asia and Africa, and saw a lot of, uh, of hearts and minds that could be won in terms of new transnational Muslim solidarity. So King Faisal um, was part of this, the same post colonial world as Nehru, Sukarno. Um, Nasser and and so on, and it seemed for a while like those people's national projects, which were so you know to really paint in broad strokes, uh, pluralist, progressive, liberal, nationalist nation states, um, were going to win, uh, and and Faisal's idea for this kind of like transnational ummah or identifying with the Islamic community more than a new nation was not looking promising. Uh, but in the end, it, it proved to it proved to be quite convincing indeed. Part of it was that America really supported um, the Saudi soft power project. It really dovetailed with the U.S.'s Cold War goals to fight communism worldwide. So for much of the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, the U.S. and Saudi worked kind of in parallel and and definitely with a carte blanche from the U.S. to support this global campaign. And Kissinger once wrote of the, the Saudi campaign that he found a helpful Saudi footprint in all the anti-communist theaters where he sought to leave a mark, such as Egypt and Somalia and Syria. Um, and then the, the thing, you know, sometimes this campaign is called Petro-Islam, uh, sometimes derogatorily, and that refers to the idea that oil money is the one financing this campaign. Um, that reputation came because of uh, the Arab-Israeli war. So in 1973, during um, there was an embargo that really led Saudi oil revenues to explode. Of course, oil had been discovered there in the 30s, but it wasn't a wash in oil money until 1973. So the combination of King Faisal's globally minded foreign policy and then this kind of huge windfall after the Arab-Israeli war um, which also took out uh, Nasser in Egypt as a, a competitor in the Islamic world, meant that Saudi Dawa really exploded. So Dawa is uh, an Arabic word. It means the call or invitation to Islam. And it gives the title for my book, The Call. Um, the Wahhabi Dawa is basically proselytizing Muslims around the world to come to their version of Islam, which is, again, quite austere um, and, and kind of decries all, all kinds of folk practices, is, is quite literalist. Um, and to, in my book, I explain how the golden age of this dawah was from 1973 to about 1990. Um, the Gulf War, when US troops were allowed to enter the Najd, really dented Saudi Arabia's Islamic credentials. Um, but then the real close to the golden age of dawah uh, was 9-11. So that was the event that really brought Islamic terrorism into the public sphere in an unprecedented way. And um, Saudi Arabia's reputation really never recovered from that, uh, both because many of the, the perpetrators of the attack were Saudis, but also because this new discourse and new focus on Islamic terrorism kind of pointed many damning fingers at Saudi Arabia. Um, and to be fair, Saudi charities had supported a lot of, you know, jihadi training camps and Al-Qaeda affiliates and so on throughout the 90s from the Balkans to the Philippines. Um, so something I learned in my travels was that Saudi charity really dropped off um, substantially after the 2001 in all the places I went to. In, in Nigeria, uh, one man who ran the Muslim World League told me he had to fire every single one of his staff. And today he still runs the charity by himself. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind because uh, now more than ever, you see Saudi terror finance or Wahhabism or Petro Islam still being thrown around as an explanatory variable as if they explain all the fundamentalisms in the Islamic world. Um, and it's important to know that's simply not true. Of course, I think any, you know, any if you give a second thought to it, it, it seems it, it, it seems like a kind of empty proposition already because how could one country be responsible for all of these? But I do want to make this point because I think it's a common misconception. Um, but what have been the effects of the Saudi campaign, if not merely all the terrorism in the world? Um, one big thing that I draw out in my book is intolerance, especially of Muslim minorities. Anti-Shia sentiment specifically, um, and Shia are the, the second main strain of Islam, but Sunnis, uh, but the Wahhabis are Sunni. Um, 
anti-Shia sentiment has been a really distinctive mark of the, the Saudi campaign. In Nigeria, there's been a really violent clash between Salafis and Shia that has led to hundreds of people being killed at the hands of the Nigerian military. In Indonesia today, uh, where fewer than 1% of people are Shia at all, um, there is a national anti-Shia league. So these kinds of developments are very distinctive mark of the Saudi campaign to me. Uh, another thing that happened is that Saudi Dawah has ironically supported quite a lot of, of, of Islamist movements worldwide, even though Saudi is, is on paper opposed to political Islam, especially today, and is opposed to the Arab Spring and things like that. Um, in, in Indonesia, the most successful Islamist political party, the Prosperous Justice Party, was heavily supported by Saudi Dawah and the Saudi University in Jakarta, which was a hugely important recruiting ground. Um, the third really big uh, effect that I draw out is that the, the scholarships program was one of the most successful things that Saudi ever did, especially at this university in Medina called the Islamic University of Medina that was founded in 1965 specifically for foreign students to become missionaries of the Saudi uh, call to Islam. And um, these Saudi alumni in every single country I went to were really influential in shaping their religious landscape. You really see this distinctly in Kosovo, for example, where Saudi charities helped rebuild the country after the war, starting in 1998 um, for about 10 years. And, and there was really no one attending, despite the huge US and UN presence there, to religious life for spiritual life in rebuilding this country that was really overwhelmingly Muslim. So if you wanted a good education and become an imam, the easiest way to do that in Kosovo for a long time was to take a scholarship and go to Saudi. So it's not surprising that so much of their Islamic revival today has a Salafi flavor to it. So this class of Salafi clerics in, in all three countries I write about has been a really distinctive mark of Saudi Dawah. And it's in part because of people like them, the fact that they tend to create movements on the ground and the fact that a lot of Saudi institutions still remain standing even without direct Saudi funding is why I talk about the legacy effects of Saudi Dawah. Even though Saudi Dawah is down in absolute terms in most of these countries, um, they have created very re resilient, durable and, and you know, diverse ecosystems, mostly of a Salafi bent. And by Salafi, I mean the 20th century movement that started in Egypt um, as an anti-colonial movement to return to the traditions of earliest Islam um, uh, and follow the traditions of the Salaf, which are the first uh, few generations of Muslims in the 8th century. Um, so there, there are Salafis all over the world now. In, in many parts, it's because of the Saudi campaign. Um, the reason that we see a lot of Salafis in the world and not Wahhabis is because Wahhabism is pretty site specific to Saudi Arabia. And also almost no one will ever describe themselves as a Wahhabi. It's kind of like a, it's often used in a derogatory way. Even in Saudi, people would probably call themselves just Muslims. They wouldn't say they're Wahhabis. So, you know, the presence of so many Salafi communities around the world today has been one of the lasting uh, effects of Saudi Dawah. So, you know, in brief, uh, that's the shape of the campaign. And the last thing I wanted to say before I, I chat with Adam a little bit is, um, you know, probably a lot of you know about Mohammed bin Salman, BS, the very, um, you know, headline making crown prince of Saudi Arabia and his famous Vision 2030 plan for diversifying the kingdom's economy away from oil. Vision 2030 certainly has had an impact on the Saudi project. Um, the Saudi University in Jakarta, for example, is now draped in Vision 2030 banners and MBS's face is all over it. So, and, and MBS has also made a lot of pronouncements on the world stage, like uh, we're going to stay extremism within one generation and so on. So it seems that he's pretty sensitive to the image that Saudi has accrued over the recent years, and um, that might have an impact on their Dawah project. But keep in mind, uh, he, he is no human rights defender, probably doesn't need to be said twice to this audience, but in terms of the, the reigning in of the Wahhabi establishment, the kinds of people he's jailed are not the most extreme or ideologically extreme Wahhabis, but the people who refuse to um, kind of bend to his authority. Um, and he's jailed a lot of reformists and human rights voices within the clerical establishment. So there is a gap between his rhetoric and his actions um, that seems to widen by the day. Um, that being said, there have been some interesting new appointments within the Dawa world. The new head of the Muslim World League, really important Saudi charity that works worldwide, 
is an unusually progressive voice named Dr. Muhammad Al Issa, who you know does things like acknowledge the Holocaust in to an audience of Jews in New York. He's gone to the Vatican. These are all really crazy progressive things um, in in a country where you know it's not unusual to find the protocols of the elders of Zion or other anti-Semitic things. It's not. Uh, and, and, and even that's even been a feature of Saudi Dabwa in the past. So these are pretty big changes. So it'll be interesting to see how this progresses. And, you know, the most important thing is that their oil revenues are really down. Um, and what we're entering now is a very multipolar world. Saudi is not even the only Gulf country proselytizing abroad now. The UAE, Kuwait, Qatar all have their own Dawa projects. Um, Iran is not such a big player on the world stage anymore. They have their own problems now and they tend to work in their own backyard. Turkey, however, is also becoming a new global Islamic power. So it's just a more crowded stage now. And this, you know, attempt to create a Saudi-centric Islamic world has peaked, in my opinion. But uh, if we've learned anything about the Saudi royal family is that instability is baked into their succession. So anything could change even tomorrow. Like if a, a new royal comes and is really a very pious Wahhabi, it's quite possible that uh, we could see start all over again. But that's where things stand right now. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Adam ask some questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Kritika, for that uh, great overview of the book and uh, opening up many avenues. I think we can explore. Just to just before uh, I move into a few questions, uh, just to recap on how we'll run this session. Uh, after I've had a brief conversation now with Kritika, uh, I'm going to open up the uh, the chat channel, uh, and if you you can just feel free to. Uh, drop uh, any questions you might have into that chat and I will feed them back to Kritika um, as we move on. I think we'll we'll aim for another um, uh, half an hour, 45 minutes or so uh, for, for, this, for this session. So uh, Kritika, to begin with, I want to actually pick up on one of the things you mentioned uh, right towards the end there, which was the kind of role of the, of the Saudi uh, government, the Saudi state, the Saudi ruling family. Uh, and I'm wondering from your, your research and your travel uh, could you speak a little bit about what what's the kind of connection between, on one hand, the, the proselytizing efforts of um, various uh, uh, religious institutions uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, and their relationship with the state and the government and the ruling family? Uh, is this a conscious uh, project uh, that's emanating from the ruling family? or is it something that's uh, that's uh, more driven by uh, the the religious establishment and relatedly uh, what's how does could you speak a little bit more about how the project actually works is this a a, uh, a material uh, benefit uh, a, a material inducement that is being provided to to places such as Indonesia and Nigeria or Kosovo or is it more ideological? Is it, is it functioning at an ideolo ideological uh, level? Yeah. Um, so to, to answer the first couple of questions you raised, the image I really like use in my book and I think is helpful is like an idea of an octopus or a starfish. So there's a lot of connected bodies. It's not coming, you know, Saudi Dawa doesn't come from any one single actor. It's from a very densely linked group of actors, including a dedicated Dawa ministry in the Saudi government. That's quite important. It oversees the religious attaches in two dozen countries. We also have the really big multinational charities like Muslim World League or Rabita, uh, IIRO, the World Assembly of Muslim Youth. These were all created in the 60s and 70s during this peak Dawa era. And they have dozens of offices worldwide and have been very influential at kind of just funds around the world. Um, we also have, um, you know, independent businessmen, uh, which is, is kind of an obscure uh, financial flow to analyze, but it's definitely been a dynamic in the past. And then there's a whole network of smaller charities because, you know, the Saudi royal family has thousands of members. So it's not uncommon for a prince or princess to have their own charity and that might have Dawa aims. Um, and then in terms of whether it's coming from the state or, or the ulama, I mean, it certainly come, it certainly has in the past been a highly royal endorsed um, directive. So I think it's it's always a push-pull relationship in Saudi between the royal family and the clerical establishment. They've often whole, wholesale taken up the Wahhabi clerics goal of spreading their Dawa worldwide. So King Faisal, as I said, was really hands-on at cultivating post-colonial leaders um, 
on a personal level and you know uh, really selecting the people who would carry this mission onward. He, for example, had a very close relationship with Mohammed Natsir, the post-colonial Indonesian leader, the first prime minister of Indonesia, who later became one of the, the chief da da'is of Saudi Dawah in Indonesia and opened an organization that funneled millions of dollars of Saudi money to uh, to Indonesia. So in the 60s and 70s, it was not uncommon for, for, for Faisal and then later King Fahd in the 80s to have a really hands-on approach to this. King Fahd uh, had a kind of playboy reputation before he became the monarch. And he um, kind of to prove a point, kind of after given the events in 1979 and the Iranian revolution, he started a lot of flashy projects too, like the King Fahad Center for printing the Quran, which continues to just print millions of Qurans uh, to this day in so many different languages. So it has had a very strong royal imprimatur in the past. Right now, I would say that there's less because, I mean, King Salman too was quite pious, um, the current king. But I would say under MBS, it's the lowest it has been because he's kind of tried to um, lessen the hold of the Wahhabi clerics on his power to an unprecedented degree. But, you know, as of now, the apparatus is still chugging on. So the Wahhabi clerics still have, you know, they have avenues in which to express their interests. Um, and then, and yeah, so I just want to say really quick, you asked about the, the specific ways it manifests. Uh, it's definitely a material and concrete way that they spread it. So first of all, money, the way that um, the way that they disperse money was that leaders from these countries go on Hajj or Umrah to Saudi and get a tazkia or like an open-ended recommendation letter. And after that, any Saudi charity could to, could funnel uh, money to them. So in Nigeria and Indonesia, both, you had a situation where um, there were two key leaders, um, Abu Bakar Gumi, who's an Islamic scholar in Nigeria, and he got, you know, direct line of funding to start his Salafi movement and anti-Sufi movement in Nigeria. Indonesia, same thing with Natsir and his organization. So on the ground, these people were then delegated to disperse money as they saw fit. So it was a really, it was actually a really great and effective technique because the the people who the, the monarchs picked out were usually good at identifying players on the ground to continue to build up the Dawah apparatus. Um, and then a lot of these uh, charities like Muslim World League and so on will, will give their own donations with a lot of local staff people. And in Kosovo, the charities were definitely the main um, way that money reached them. The Saudi Joint Relief Committee for Kosovo was created, uh, Kosovo and Chechnya was created in the 90s, shortly after the Bosnian War. So that was an umbrella organization overseen by one of the Saudi princes to funnel um, direct aid to Kosovo. And, and through your research, did you uh, did you ascertain any linkages with uh, the formal kind of Islamic financial sector, uh, you know, Islamic banks or, or or other kinds of Islamic financial instruments, uh, or were these two separate uh, spheres of, of influence? I think in the 60s and 70s there was a potential for a lot more overlap between you know, things like Islamic finance um, and even like the OIC and Dawa like they had elective affinities but i would say as as of the time i was reporting um they had largely decoupled okay perhaps moving on then to uh i mean uh, your 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 research and i know having supervised your your dissertation it's very uh you you know you you did a lot of on the ground work uh that's evident in the book uh i was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the the challenges of actually doing this kind of research uh in in these in these varied countries uh speaking to um actors involved in 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 these circles uh there must have been some uh, uh interesting and, and difficult kind of research experiences that you went through yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges, of course, um, one, so in Kosovo, a big challenge was language for me. I don't speak Albanian, so I really did have to work quite extensively with fixers and translators in the ground. Luckily, I had a really good team of people there and, and a lot of people in Kosovo. I found, for the most part, I actually found that people were very happy to talk, unless they were really, like, jihadist. Like, I had a couple of attempted meetings with really extreme types that didn't really pan out. But, um, but Salafis are very happy to talk and even to debate. And uh, I had a good time debating with like young Salafi scholars in Nigeria and so on, um, in part because of, I had been studying Islamic studies at SOA, so I actually knew some stuff to say. Um, but I, I found a lot of Salafis were very keen to talk about a project that, or a, a movement that they feel has been misrepresented in world media. So in Nigeria, I really felt like I had pretty good access 
and a lot of people there spoke English too and were very accommodating and you know, open to talking about uh, you know their history and how the Salaf movement has developed there. Um, in Indonesia, I lived there for like quite a long time, two years and then another another half a year after that. So I had kind of a deeper network of contacts there and I, I think it's not a coincidence that I got kind of my most interesting reporting, some of my most interesting reporting there. For example, I, I met, you know, I wanted to learn about the impact of the Iranian revolution on Indonesia and I got to meet the Indonesian who sat on the plane with Ayatollah Khomeini from Paris to Tehran in 1979 and he was able to tell me directly how that news was re received back in Indonesia. So those kinds of deep contacts I think um, were there in Indonesia and uh, in an ideal world would be able to spend two years in all of these countries. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, was there anything uh, particularly surprising or interesting? Uh, uh, what what really stood out in terms of um, what you what you did discover during this field work? Um, I think that the, the, the kind of across the board decline in absolute terms was a surprise to me. Um, I especially in Nigeria, it was kind of put in pretty stark terms by a lot of the people I, I spoke with, um, that 9-11 that led to a steep drop-off um, in active funding. And in Indonesia, too, I was surprised at how much Salafism had become indigenized and was no longer externally supported. Another thing that surprised me in Indonesia and Nigeria was the really strong um, personal imprint and legacy of Natsir and Gumi, these two leaders in the 60s, who, you know, their deputies that they had hand-picked back in the golden age of Dabo, were still running a lot of these organizations today. So like the guy who runs DDII today, the main instrument of Saudi Dawa in the past to Indonesia, is this Chinese scholar hand-picked by um, Natsir. And something else that surprised me about some of these older generation I met is that they really had this inhabited this very cosmopolitan Islam, Islamic world um, that in its own way was like a product of this post-war globalization. They, as these big Saudi charities were being created in these universities, um, like the World Assembly of Michigan, it was like really an exciting time is what I got the sense of, that they would go to these big conferences in Jeddah and Riyadh and, and so on and meet these young Muslim leaders from all over the world. And this global Ummah consciousness was emerging. And I was surprised just by how cosmopolitan and interconnected it all was. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Krithika. Mate, perhaps we'll uh, open up uh, the chat room now. So if you do have any questions, um, please uh, uh, please just drop them into the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll start feeding them in, into Krithika. So uh, we what, we begin, Krithika, if you could speak a little bit. Someone was also interested in your, in your field work, uh, in particular uh, in Aceh, uh, in Indonesia, uh, if you've had, um, you know, your, your, your experience on the ground there, if you could perhaps speak to that. Um, I'm so glad whoever this was asked about Aceh. Um, so Aceh was one of the most surprising places I did my field work. It is the westernmost province of Indonesia and it's widely considered the most conservative place in Indonesia. It's the only province of Indonesia with Sharia and it was also infamously devastated by the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. So I went to Aceh in 2017 um, expecting to find just like so much stuff about Saudi Dawa. And I was right and wrong. There were a lot of Saudi charities that set up in Aceh after the tsunami, especially. But I was also very surprised that Salafis and Achenese traditional clerics had clashed in almost unprecedented terms. Like they had almost come to arms in like violent protests in the Grand Mosque of Banda Aceh because the, the Achenese really resented the idea that. Uh, Salafi or Saudi trained imams were trying to influence their way of praying and their folk practices. So, you know, Ajini's mosque like burned down Salafi schools or schools led by Saudi alumni in their province and they've mounted a pretty serious resistance to sal perceived Salafism, even though there remains like a Saudi charity campaign office there. Um, there is an Arabic language school in Aceh run by um, Saudi charity. So, uh, I thought that was so interesting. It just shows how it's not a one-way street between Saudi Dawa and Salafism because uh, one of the people I met there who was a free Aceh guerrilla leader, had been a free Aceh guerrilla leader, told me, you know, we can take their money, but we don't need to take their ideas. I thought that was a very interesting spin. Yes. 
a couple more uh, questions. We have, there's a couple of questions in the chat around uh, the uh, these these funding networks uh, and and the kind of proselytizing network. Uh, in relation to Saudi Arabia's more overt political and military um, projection of power uh, in the Middle East, obviously, um, you know, it's, it's very clear in many uh, countries, particularly post the Arab uprisings. Um, but also there's a question, so if, if you could speak first, I guess, to how you see the overlap between that kind of uh, uh, kind of religious outreach and the more political and military uh, growing military, military and political influence of Saudi Arabia in the region. Uh, and mm -hmm. secondly, uh, under Mohammed um, bin Salman, do you think there has been, particularly given the, the, the uh, rivalry and, and the conflict with Iran, if there's been any, uh, uh, if the anti-Shia uh, component of, of this, uh, this uh, movement has been in any, any way reduced or, or shifted under, under Mohammed bin Salman? Um, yeah, so in terms of the military commitments, I, I was looking specifically at countries where there was not a big Saudi military presence because I was interested in soft power, but you're certainly right that there is a you know, very large Saudi military presence in a lot of neighboring countries in the region. And what I would say to that is that, the, you know, especially the Saudi-Iran dynamic and rivalry is more alive in the neighborhood just to say the Middle East, than it is in the in the greater Muslim world. But the countries I was looking at were not countries where there were troops on the ground or anything like that, not places where Saudi intervened. Even in Kosovo, where there was a war, it was Saudi relief. It wasn't that they were sending troops there. So I think they're quite distinct um, in terms of Dawa versus um, Dawa versus military commitments. But I know that you know Saudi relief apparatus has often mobilized relief two war zones and a signature of Saudi relief there is that it is combined almost always with uh, proselytization, which has, you know, that model has proven so successful that it's now commonplace among other Gulf countries like Kuwait. So if you see Kuwaiti tr charities in places like Syria, they often combine with Salafi proselytization. And that's a really distinctive kind of Saudi innovation. Um, and in terms of MBS and Shia, you know, he has been pretty vocally anti-Shia in the past. He has Made a, he has, you know, made a lot of statements about Iran's leaders, called them worse than Hitler. He's said anti-Shia things in the past. Um, but he's also made some interesting um, appointments, I think, to Aramco and to his future city of Neom. He's appointed some Shia leaders to some of these new positions. So I'm curious to see if he will moderate some of his early rhetoric. Because when he came to the public, you know, when he arose to his position, he was originally quite stridently anti-Shia and seemed to continue um, you know, one of the one of this, this very typical and sad discourse, which, by the way, there are you know millions of Shia in Saudi Arabia too, especially in the Eastern Province. So it's not just an outside dynamic, but also a dynamic inside the country. Okay, uh, we've also got a couple of questions here further on on your field work. Uh, someone is asking uh, why you chose these three particular countries uh, uh, to explore. And secondly, how did you actually go about uh, uncovering some of these networks, making these contacts, meeting with these people? Um, how did you actually establish these, these, these networks? Um, so Indonesia to me was the non-negotiable entry point. Um, I, you know, I'm really interested in, in the Islamic world as like, I think I've said decentering before, but it really is so large. It's like 1.8 billion people. And I was very interested in if it's a global campaign to look at it in kind of uh, to widen the lens, so to speak. So Indonesia is the demographic center of the, in Southeast Asia is like one of the demographic centers of the Muslim world today. I think it's so important to think about what goes on there when we talk about the Islamic world. Um, and, uh, and the range of Saudi the range of the Saudi campaign there it's is unparalleled. It has everything from the religious attache to this personal high leader cooperations to really small grassroots networks. And you just have this whole and the Saudi university and it's just like really a lot of great stuff to report on, which I hope you can read in the book as well. Um, and then I really want to look at Africa and um, I thought that Nigeria would be interesting because it seemed to have some structural similarities to Indonesia and in that it was a post-colonial country and Saudi Dawa really helped Salafism find a place in a predominant, predominantly Sufi region in northern Nigeria in record time. And I thought some of the soft power links were so interesting between the clerics of West Africa and, and Hijaz. They've had really long and deep links. The first president even of, of the 
Islamic University in Medina was a Nigerian. And um, I thought this kind of scholarships dimension, how scholars influence religious landscape, um, and later how Salafism beca became so popular so fast that it broke off and created this fringe of Boko Haram, which is a very infamous jihadist group today. I thought that was all very interesting and a subtle and interesting new dynamic with this non-Arab African, not Arabic speaking African country. Uh, and then Kosovo, you know, I actually initially thought I was going to write about Bosnia because um, there's a lot of literature about the Bosnian Mujahideen and the foreign fighters who came directly from Afghanistan to Bosnia. And, you know, there's been a lot of media about like Salafi and Wahhabi in Rose in Bosnia. I spent like more than a month there and I didn't see evidence of that. So I scrapped that and um, I looked to Kosovo instead. And there I actually found that Saudi charities had been super influential really fast and in a compressed time frame. So Kosovo is really interesting because it has the highest per capita, um, it was the highest per capita contributor of ISIS fighters of any European country. And um, the fact that Salafism and even Salafi Jihadism found a root in this very small country in record time, within about 20 years, was so interesting to me. And I thought it would be a really interesting new case study um, and one where you can meet almost all of the key players because they're all still alive. So that was my goal. But you could definitely add more countries to the analysis for sure. I was limited by being one person, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, making those uh, uh, connections and, and contacts, how did you go about that? Oh, yeah. So Indonesia, I mean, I worked there as a journalist, so there was a lot of casual sort of so on. Um, I, you know, luckily, I was working on my degree while I was researching this book. So I did a lot of research, like maybe more than I would have otherwise, because I'm a little bit of a, an ad hoc kind of person. And my motto is usually just to show up and hope things go well, which is nice if you're a journalist, but um, it's not nice if you're you know, spending a huge amount of money to go to Nigeria for two weeks at a time. So I did a lot of research in the Thawaz Library. I read like everything I could about Salafism and Wahhabism in these places and the Saudi campaign. And there's a lot of academic literature really about this. So I identified people to talk to on the ground. And once you get there and meet some of these people and get the ball rolling, um, then you can, it kind of opens up the whole world for you. And the thing is, because these are so based on dense personal networks, like it really is like one thing leading to another. But in terms of um, in terms of efficient reporting on the ground and identifying these people, I would say I did a lot of library hours before I ever got on a plane. There's there's also a question here around uh, 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 the relationship, an increasingly close relationship between Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Israel. Um, and I was wondering, or uh, one of the one of the participants was wondering if you could perhaps speak to that, and if you think uh, this is having any effect, perhaps on Israel's uh, Israel's position uh, within within the Middle East. Um, yeah, I mean it's a very interesting relationship, uh, in my opinion, and it's kind of like a high level relationship based on like security and things like that, uh, because you know anti-Semitism has been historically a big part of. Like, Saudi translated Qurans and things like that. There's a lot of verses and commentary about like against Jews and it's been flagged often by reviews of Saudi textbooks. So I do think it's a high level security relationship for the most part. And uh, uh, it's a question around uh, uh, Kosovo more, if you could speak more to this, uh, in particular, what you think the, uh, the effect has been on this kind of socio cultural identity uh, in, in Kosovo. Um, yeah, so so Kosovo, which is is mostly ethnically Albanian, has a really really strong, um, unusually strong secular tradition. So the the ruling government administration and popular culture, for the most part, is is very secular. Um, but I think that this kind of vocal new Salafi minority and the fact that Salafism has colored the religious uh, revival in Kosovo has led to some culture clashes. Um, I think that the government finds it a little bit hard to handle um, some of these new developments. For example, it's a 98% Muslim country, but you cannot wear a hijab in schools if you're a if you're a girl, and um, that's led to some conflicts and things like that. So, and also, I mean, I think that the the phenomenon that Foreign fighters have really shocked and um, and and upset uh, a lot of people, so especially in 2015, 2016. It was like um, it was really a devastating phenomenon, especially because the places where young men most left from were really poor rural areas, kind of near the Macedonian border, and it was really devastating. The whiplash of some of the intergenerational change, where you have these like 
parents who are really committed Marxists and then are atheists and then their kids become like committed jihadists. So the the rapidness with which some of these things happened and also the fact that uh, the Salvi revival in, in Kosovo has been aided by mass media and internet has almost always been there. Um, that's been uniquely fast. And goes, you know, Pristina, the capital of Kosovo today, is home to this Albanian language Salafi media outlet called Peace TV, which runs like almost nonstop programming and it holds, you know, there's a lot of Salafi bookshops there. And the fact that it's become that this center of like Albanian Salafism it is really is really astounding. It just again, it just I can't underscore how fast all of this was. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you explore at all the, the gender dimensions? Uh, one one person is asking here. Um, yeah, a little bit. I would definitely say that Salafism has been male dominated for most part in all the countries I went to. I met some interesting women figures um, in Nigeria. I met a really cool um, woman, Halima Shitu, Sheikha Halima Shitu who studied in Mecca. She was a female Saudi alumnus and she became a very influential female Salafi preacher. And I attended one of her sermons uh, during Ramadan, which she held at 11 a.m. so that women could come with their kids and go back home to um, cook dinner that day. And she was one of the most influential sheikhs in Kano in Northern Nigeria. Unfortunately, she recently died of coronavirus. But I mean, it was really cool for me to see that uh, it was unusual to see uh, such an influential woman Salafi, but uh, I think she was the exception that proved the rule. For the most part, unfortunately, a lot of people who talk in my book are males because it, it is men who tend to carry out this, uh, to tend to carry out this project. Mm -hmm. We also have a question here. Uh, if you could talk uh, uh, perhaps further on the effect that this might uh, be having on other Islamic uh, uh, communities um, uh, globally. Uh, and I, I guess relatedly, uh, a question around uh, Mohammed bin Salman and his supposed moderation, whether this uh, has meant that the, the movements themselves, the, these uh, Dawa networks, have become perhaps somewhat more autonomous now and, and able to, um, to, 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 to mobilize uh, and set priorities outside of the sphere of um, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like effects, I mean, I think one of the common themes in my book is this new democratic, often more conservative brushing up against traditional, slightly more hierarchical, dusty author authority structures. And it's, you know, Salafis worldwide have proven, or at least in all the countries I have looked at, have proven very adept at using at using mass media and that's been a big part of their appeal. Like in Nigeria, so many young people told me that like they didn't find the Sufi um, hierarchical structures very appealing because it was so like undemocratic and you had to, it was beautiful and full of meaning and tradition, but they didn't feel like they could be active players. So they felt like with Salafism, which privileges direct access to texts and some of the preachers were so charismatic and so on. That's why they wanted to join it. So I think, you know, that's one reason why Salafism has proved so appealing on the ground in a lot of these places. Another um, young imam I met in Kosovo said when he was growing up, he grew up during the war, he was a he had a lot of questions and Salafis had all the answers. So I think this like kind of very rapid growth of Salafism in the late 20th century has led to clashes um, in Nigeria, you know, Shia Salafi or Salafi. Sufi. Um, in Indonesia, it's led to Salafi jihadist movements, including a paramilitary group called Laskar Jihad. In Kosovo, it's led to a very small um, but devastating number of foreign fighters. So I think these kinds of conflicts are in some ways, I don't want to say inherent to Salafism, but commonly a byproduct of a new Salafi community. Um, and the second one in terms of are they autonomous? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's one of the key themes of my book is that like the Dawa campaign has been successful in putting these seeds on the ground in a lot of places and Salafi communities really don't need too much extra help now, especially because so much is available online. Like you can find every fatwa of, of any sheikh you we, we wish to look up online from Bin Baz or, or and so on to the complete works of Ibn Taymiyyah. Like you don't, the Saudi printed books have much less importance in a relative scale now that we're awash in media. Um, in, in Indonesia, many of the new Salafi media outlets and groups and so on are completely indigenous. They don't have any, not even a drop of outside funding. Um, so I would say, yes, it's become, I mean, Salafism is in the 20th century, 
by being a transnational movement. I think this transnational aspect helps preserve it now, even when there's not like so much external funding. Like people can connect online so easily now. Great. Okay. Uh, maybe there's there's uh, two more questions that I'd like to throw at you, um, and perhaps we'll we'll wind it up there. Uh, the, the, and these questions are both to do with the future, so it's a good place to end. Um, firstly, someone is asking what you think is perhaps the, the future of this kind of soft power, the Saudi soft power. And then uh, an even bigger question, uh, someone would like you to weigh in on what you think the future of the House of, of uh, Saud might be uh, in, the current, uh, in the current moment. Um, with regards to the House of Saud, I really, I cannot prognosticate. One of the smartest people I know on this subject, Bernard Haeckel, who's a scholar of, of Arabia, says that anyone who has strong opinions about the Saudi royal family doesn't know anything about them, and everyone who does know anything wouldn't talk. So I, you know, I would say that uh, as to, to beg off. I think, um, especially during the pandemic, there have been so many. Um, upheavals in the House of Saud that even MBS's unprecedented consolidation of power looks in more jeopardy than it has in the recent past. Um, I would also defer to uh, London's own Madabi al-Rashid, who has written extensively about how instability is baked into succession in the House of Saud. There are so many Saudi royals. The internal power dynamics are always changing. So I don't know what's next. I think um, uh, MBS is definitely testing the Wahhabi relationship more than it has been in the past. I think that pact will endure for a little while longer, certainly. I think there's popular support for it among Saudi nationals for sure. I don't think it's going to go away, but it might change to an unrecognizable degree. Um, and uh, what's next for Saudi Dawa? I mean, it's it's uh, it's going down is the, is the main takeaway. It's like decreasing by the day. Um, 2014 oil crash was very significant in terms of um, uh, decreasing the absolute resources available. I also analyzed Dawa ministry uh, reports in my book and in absolute terms, all of the activities they list from missionaries to prison visits to printing Qurans, all are down in almost every country in the world over the last five years. And um, since MBS came to power, Dawa ministry officials have indicated uh, that there have been fewer resources allocated for their ministry, just anecdotally. So it seems like it's going down. And uh, I think a multipolar Islamic world is really, um, is, is already the state of affairs and it's going to continue to be the state of affairs um, because, you know, in the Balkans, Turkey is by far the most important player. Turkey oversees, the DNN oversees the Hajj for all Balkan Muslims now, which is a huge indicator, I think, of of, uh, of their clout there. Um, and, you know, Qatar supports uh, Islamist movements worldwide. That's kind of their flavor of da'wah. The UAE tends to support Sufi oriented movements worldwide. It's just a crowded field now. So, and, and, to, and Iran, uh, which I saw some questions popping up, um, you know, Iran was once a, such an important player, and I really go into it in my book. The impact of the Iranian Revolution was deeply felt and moving. It was moving to so many Muslims worldwide. It was it was seen at the time as a very, you know, as a win for the whole Islamic world. So like, I I saw like books by Ali Shariati translated into Hausa, Indonesian, and so on, and it was impactful at the time. But now Iranian cultural centers, for the most part, are not doing extensive dawah this far. It out into the Muslim world. I would say Iran's commitments are more in their backyard. Um, and in Iran Iranian cultural centers today tend to be kind of like full of travel brochures and, and Persian poetry and things like that, like really like low stakes cultural activities and not like extensive proselytizing. Um, so I think that's my answer. It's a crowded field and Saudi's uh, clout in, in the Dawah sense is decreasing by the day. Thank you very much, Krithika, for a, a really uh, insightful and, and rich uh, presentation and a, and a great book. Uh, congratulations on having uh, this book, your first book, come out, um, and hopefully the first of, of many. Uh, if people want to pick up a copy, uh, they can do so, I believe, from the Columbia Global Reports uh, uh, site. Uh, and I'd also like to thank very much uh, the participants, uh, some great questions coming through. And um, to keep an eye out for future events, uh, we will be holding, uh, as the Middle East Institute, other events of this type um, over the coming weeks and into, into uh, the next academic year. So please stick with us. Even though we're under lockdown, we'll still be, uh, still be hopefully hosting these kinds of events. So thanks very much, Krithika, and congratulations again. Thank you.
thank you so much. And everyone who's here, I know it's uh, there are more questions than answers, but feel free to get in touch with me uh, via my website or Twitter or whatever. I'm very open to talking about this more. Thank you, Adam. Thank you thank so much. Great to be here virtually.